This is Salma Shemel at the ASCO annual meeting in Chicago for the group room as we now shift our discussion to prostate cancer with Dr. David Quinn, medical director of the Norris Cancer Hospital, co-leader of the Genital Urinary Cancers Program for the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, head of the section of Genital Urinary Medical Oncology, and Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cancer Medicine and Blood Diseases at the Keck School of Medicine at USC, University of Southern California. Hi, Dr. Quinn. How are you doing, Selma? I'm doing okay. Busy meeting and some good activity yes. and coming out here in prostate cancer. Interesting stuff. Talk to us. We've seen some new things uh, since we last talked. Uh, we got a little glimpse of uh, radium-223 an injectable radiation is given intravenously every four weeks uh, for six doses developed at the Norwegian Radium Institute hmm. uh, and now uh, moved into an international study, the Alsimpka study, in which they took men that had castrate resistant prostate cancer who would have been potential candidates for chemotherapy with docetaxel, a standard treatment, um, or uh, but they declined it or were not suitable or whom had had docetaxel chemotherapy and then progressed after it. So they treated these men, it was a randomized study uh, uh, where two thirds of the patients got the injection of radium-223 every month and one third uh, did not, but they were allowed to have best supportive care. So some radiation, they were allowed to change hormones. So they got treated, uh, but with relatively standard treatments and the, the radium was the different element. Uh, what we got, at GU ASCO uh, in February was uh, some really late breaking uh, uh, stuff from that trial uh, that occurred with an interim analysis soon after the trial finished accruing. And it was somewhat of a surprise to all of us that that early in the process there was a survival advantage uh, to giving radium and, and uh, one that was statistically significant uh, even given the limited follow up. Uh, what we've seen here at ASCO is a, is a further update with a very significant uh, increase in the, uh, the survival in between the two arms. And uh, this looks to be very, very active, uh, as active as any compound that we've seen in prostate cancer for the last 20 years. And uh, it's a targeted therapy. It hits uh, specifically bone metastases from prostate that produce an osteoblastic reaction and that's typical of prostate cancer. So more than 95% of our, our men with advanced prostate cancer develop bone metastases. And we have other agents that can hit this, uh, but this is very specific. It's a very narrow band where the radiation is not really given to the whole body, it's given to this area around where the prostate cancer cells uh, sit. So it's very neat technology and uh, it uh, appears to have very limited toxicity from what we're seeing from the uh, trial. Uh, and it uh, produces major responses in the main bone enzyme, something called alkaline phosphatase, that we routinely measure in the blood. It also has some effect on PSA, usually it stabilizes it, can, can put it down. And it has major palliative benefit. So we get pain relief, uh, we get uh, killing of cancer cells where they sit within the bone and we get extended survival. So this is actually really good news for our prostate cancer uh, population. Good news coming soon. For some people, they probably are going to want it sooner. I think so. Indeed. What else? We saw some update with a, with a, a drug called abiraterone acetate, uh, the brand name Zytiga. And previously, uh, a study had demonstrated a very significant survival advantage and other advantages to this drug for patients that have previously had chemotherapy, uh, usually with docetaxel. What we saw from uh, Dr. Charles Ryan from uh, University of California, San Francisco, uh, was an excellent presentation uh, on the drug given in a randomized trial uh, compared to prednisone uh, before chemotherapy. And in this particular trial, there were two endpoints that were put forward. One was uh, progression in scans uh, without PSA. Um, and so uh, the scan progression data were very impressive, very wide uh, difference between the two arms. Clearly abiraterone uh, much, much, much better than just the prednisone alone. Although some activity for the prednisone. In terms of the survival curve, there was some controversy uh, because the uh, Data Safety Monitoring Committee that was reviewing this, having seen improvement in symptoms, 
improvement in progression-free survival in terms of what was happening on the scans said that the, the trial should be stopped. And I, I personally agree with that. And at that stage, uh, they had done a probability analysis for producing an overall survival difference. And usually, we want an overall survival difference in prostate cancer uh, to uh, be assured of registration and be assured we're benefiting our patients. Uh, well, in this study, uh, in actual fact, uh, they narrowly missed the boundary for an early analysis, and they'll continue to look, look at it. Uh, but there's a significant divergence of these curves in favor of abiraterone. Uh, the, one of the problems was that patients were living far longer with, uh, with abiraterone and also on the control arm with prednisone than we had a, a anticipated when the study was designed some five or six years ago. Now that's because we're doing much better in prostate cancer and we're becoming a little bit of a victim of our own success. Now at this meeting uh, uh, Dr. Susan Halabi who's uh, uh, a, uh, uh, an internationally renowned uh, cancer statistician from uh, the Alliance uh, Group, used to be called uh, Cancer and Cancer and Leukemia Group B, did a, a very uh, good presentation on the statistics uh, for the overall survival. And I, I think that uh, my conclusion from her presentation, even though she was a little deferential, uh, which is a statistician's nature, my conclusion was that uh, in actual fact that the, the probability that there's an overall survival advantage with abiraterone before docetaxel uh, exceeds 93 percent yeah. and I think that's good enough for me and we already have this drug approved in um, the United States and uh, coming in Europe and uh, many other centers and I, I think that uh, we need to open this up now and make it available to men before docetaxel. It's great to hear especially for men with metastatic disease how yeah. many opportunities there are for them clinically. I think that the opportunities have uh, started to come. There is one last uh, treatment we're talking about. We've done androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, initially, this was done with uh, uh, orchidectomy, uh, or orchiectomy, as it's called in the United States, uh, where we removed both testicles. And uh, we then developed uh, injectable ways of doing this uh, with drugs like Lupron and Zolodex and, and Elagard and Trollstar. And um, as part of uh, looking at therapy, we didn't want to take men's testosterone away permanently. And we, we knew from early experiments and studies that there might be some advantages to giving men breaks to therapy, particularly if they seem to respond well uh, to the hormone uh, component. So the, if, if they had a very good uh, PSA and other response to the injection, it might be great to take them off that. Well, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, the Southwest Oncology Group, uh, uh, led by Dr. Maha Hussain in this trial, from, uh, she's from Michigan, uh, designed a trial to compare intermittent therapy uh, to continuous therapy. And uh, so it took us a long time to accrue to this study, uh, principally because we had to accrue longer because the men uh, lived longer, almost twice as long as we'd expected. So it was good news and we've made that progress. Uh, but what uh, happened in the analysis was a little bit unexpected. Uh, our anticipation and the conventional wisdom for many people was that intermittent therapy did not lose anything in terms of control of cancer and improved the quality of life for the patients that uh, had intermittent therapy as opposed to continuing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the study at 9346 presented on the plenary session uh, here at ASCO uh, on Sunday, uh, we, we, we uh, have now uh, seen to question whether intermittent therapy is good for all patients in terms of controlling their cancer. Uh, in the study, uh, we had a particular uh, boundary that we had to get over to assume that the two were equivalent. We did not get over that boundary. So in double negative parlance, we found uh, that uh, intermittent therapy was not, not inferior to continuous. Now does that mean it's, it's worse? Well, I think what we can't tell people is that it's equivalent. And there were certain groups of men classified as having minimal disease rather than extensive, that seem to do worse with intermittent therapy. And that runs counter to our conventional wisdom as well. And so we need to really look at, at this study and, and see what it means. Confusing the issue a little bit more is that uh, in an analysis that was presented at this meeting today, uh, at the poster session, uh, patients that had intermittent therapy had better function in terms of their sexual activity, their uh, general energy and overall quality of life. 
in, uh, in those domains. And so we now have a situation where this is a very important study, somewhat controversial. We had an extended discussion about it uh, hosted by ASCO yesterday where there were a range of opinions. But uh, essentially uh, it allows us to talk to men and say, okay, if you want to do intermittent therapy, there will be some quality of life advantages. But there may be an issue where uh, your disease is not controlled uh, to the point where your survival is, is somewhat worse. And of concern in the minimal uh, uh, disease extent patients was there appeared to be a two year uh, benefit to continuous therapy over intermittent. And uh, over a period of uh, some five to seven years, uh, that may be important. Some men may say, I'll risk that and I'll have better quality of life. The other thing we don't know is with all these new drugs that are being developed, some great new treatments, we've got abiraterone, Medivation 3100, now called enzalutamide, uh, which I think will be registered this year, uh, the radium-223 uh, immunotherapy with uh, Cyplus LT. Um, is this the same world as when we started this study many years ago? Well, I think we still use the basic premise of androgen deprivation therapy. We haven't been able to get anything before that that's made a difference for men with metastatic disease. So I think that we need to apply uh, these findings judiciously but with caution. And uh, we have some more analysis to do in the Southwest Oncology Group uh, to, to look at the reasons why we found these results. But often uh, counterintuitive results are the most important. And I think we're, we've still got a lot to learn even about our most basic treatments. I think the conversation has come a long way since our very first sit down over prostate cancer. Indeed it has. Thank you, Dr. David Quinn, Medical Director, Norris Cancer Hospital, co-leader of the Genitourinary Cancers Program for the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, head of the section of genitourinary medical oncology, and associate professor of medicine in the division of cancer medicine and blood diseases, the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Thank you, Selma.